Good evening. Welcome to the third faculty lecture in the St. Joseph's College Centennial Series. Both this spring and next fall, we are in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the founding of St. Joseph's College by the courageous and visionary Sisters of Mercy who did realize the promise. The Sisters of Mercy continue to be a guiding light for our college as we enter our second millennium, as we all together realize the promise into the future. We hope that you will continue to support the events of the centennial with the next faculty lecture on April 3rd by Mary Lynn Ingle about personal branding. Then on April 11th, we are honored to have Father Monk Malloy come to our campus for a very special evening. Father Malloy is a noted theologian, theologian author, and was the long-serving president of the University of Notre Dame. It is my distinct pleasure on this first day of spring to introduce Camilla Fecto. Ms. Fecto is lab coordinator and instructor in the biology department at St. Joseph's College of Maine. Originally from Vermont, she graduated from the University of Maine at Farmington with a BS in environmental science and then the University of Southern Maine with an MS degree in biology. Her primary research focus has been mercury toxicology in wild bird populations. She has worked as a biologist for the Loon Preservation Committee of New Hampshire, the Biodiversity Research Institute at Gorham, Maine, where she has studied the effects of mercury on a number of bird species, including belted kingfishers, common loons, and a variety of seabirds, waterfowl, raptors, and songbirds. She has worked as the field coordinator for the Casco Bay Estuaries Partnership in Portland, where she surveyed barriers to fish passage in the Crooked River, Crooked River watershed. She is very interested in the use of birds and other living organisms as indicators of environmental health and the effects of mercury on avian reproductive success. Ms. Fecto finds great reward in educating the non-scientific community about environmental concerns and has worked with children and adults to build awareness about environmental issues we currently face. She sees her role as a translator and a messenger for the scientific community. Please give a warm welcome to Camilla Fecto. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Um, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming to my talk tonight on the first day of spring. Um, I also want to thank the Centennial Planning Committee for selecting me to give this lecture. I know that as I round out my second year, I'm still a newbie here at St. Joe's, and the opportunity to share my passion with all of you is one that I greatly appreciate. I think the Centennial theme, Realize the Promise, is one that fits my uh, focus of my talk very well. As a biologist, and even more fundamentally as a human, I feel I have an obligation to take care of our planet and all its inhabitants. I like to think that as a mercy institution, St. Joseph's College has that same duty. My hope heading into the future is that we as a mercy community can keep our promise to respect and care for the planet that we call home. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, the common loon, which is uh, a very um, popular symbol of wilderness here in Maine. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, loon life history, um, threats to loon populations, what scientists are doing for loon populations, and what you, um, as interested um, parties, can do uh, to help loon populations. So, the common loon is, uh, you know, this this symbolic um, bird that we think of when we think of Maine wilderness. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to the common loon, there are four species of loon that breed in North America. We've got the yellow-billed loon, um, the Pacific loon, the Arctic loon, and the red-throated loon. None of these loons breed in New England. Um, they're mostly found on the western coast of North America. This is the distribution wrap um, for the common loon. 
what you'll notice is that loons um, breed inland and they spend the winter uh, on the coast. And so they migrate um, from the ocean to their breeding grounds in the spring and then back to the ocean in the winter. So this is a, a, a bird, uh, this is the common merganser, and this is a duck. Uh, loons are not ducks. Um, and loons are uh, a very ancient bird species. Um, they're, they're not actually very closely related to ducks. Um, they're more closely related to penguins. And if you look at their bills, you can actually see similarities in their face structure. And they're also closely related to a group of birds called the um, tube nose swinners. This is a wandering albatross. Loons are active predators. And so um, some of you, if you are on a, a lake, you may, may have seen a loon sort of peering its head under the water. And that loon is looking for food. Loons typically eat fish. They may go for um, salamanders, crustaceans. Um, but they, when they dive, they don't use their wings to swing. They, uh, swim. They actually have very small wings. Um, and they use their feet, which are located very far back on their bodies, sort of as a propeller. Um, this is a, you can see a loon that, that's diving in this picture. Um, because loons have much, much um, smaller wings uh, than other birds their size, and they weigh so much, uh, loons can weigh up to 12 pounds, which is very heavy for a bird. Um, they have a really high what's called wing loading, and that's the amount of weight that their wings have to carry. And so when a loon is taking off from a lake, it has to literally run across the water to take off, and it may have to run for up to a quarter of a mile before it can become airborne. And even after that point, it may have to circle a few times to get over surrounding mountains. Um, once loons are in the air, they can fly very fast. They can go um, up to 80 miles an hour. Because loons um, have their feet located uh, far back on their bodies, they're pr pretty helpless on land. They can't walk on land. Um, and so they're, they're pretty uh, restricted to water. And as a result, they have to nest right on the water's edge, uh, which makes um, shoreline habitat very important to these birds. So loon nests um, can be uh, very widely ranging. Some loon nests can be really simple, as you can see um, in this picture. This is a loon that's literally scraped away some sand and laid some eggs on the beach. Um, the, the nest below is uh, what we call a hummock, where uh, a loon will um, nest in some, some sort of roots. They may pull up vegetation also. Loon nests may be very well hidden, uh, as you can see in the bottom picture, or they may be right in the open. And these preferences um, vary by individual loons. Um, so a loon assesses a habitat when it gets there and it says, what do I need to do to create a place that's going to be safe and protected? Um, and that, that determines what its nesting site looks like. Loons almost always lay two eggs. They may lay one, they may lay three, but most commonly they lay two. And you can see how large they are compared to chicken eggs. Loons, um, the male and female, take turns um, incubating. And then once the chick is hatched, they'll also take turns taking care of the young. Um, this is a picture of a loon that is um, turning the eggs. So once, say, for example, if this is a, a female that has just replaced a male loon, she's going to turn those eggs every time she switches with him to make sure that they're evenly incubated. Incubation lasts um, 28 to 30 days. And once the chicks have hatched, they don't stay on land very long, because land's not a safe place for, uh, a, for a loon. So the chicks literally just stay on the nest long enough to dry off, and then they jump into the water. So loon chicks are um, what, we, what we call precocial. They're birds that are born ready to go. Um, they don't, uh, some birds are born naked and blind, and they're very um, uh, vulnerable, and their parents have to take more care of them. Loons are precocial. They're born ready to swim. They can't fly, of course. They've got a lot of growing to do, but um, they have huge feet. And this is the, you know, the quintessential loon picture of the, the back riding chicks. Um, chicks uh, will oftentimes ride on the back of their um, adult uh, loons. And sometimes they'll even like, hide under the um, wings. And this is thought to have two purposes. One purpose is to protect those loon chicks from predators that would uh, come from underneath like a large fish that would eat them. Um, and also it's thought to um, keep them warm because in the springtime, and even in the early summer when loon chicks are born, the water's still relatively cold. They don't have waterproofing on their feathers yet as much as the adults do, and so this is thought to um, help in thermoregulation. Um, loons uh, defend their territories uh, pretty aggressively, and so this, these are two common territorial stances that you may have seen uh, loons doing on lakes. 
Uh, the first one is called wing rowing, and so that wing, that bird's pro propelling itself forward on the water. The second one we call the penguin dance. And you know, people often say, oh, that loon's doing a nice display. This is a, sh this is a show of aggression. This is a loon that's upset because it thinks there's a predator in its um, territory. And so a loon that's doing this is spending energy um, trying to get that predator out of its territory. So it's not necessarily something that we like to see. You know, It happens. Um, but if it's due to a, a human, that's something that's um, not necessarily a good thing. So loons have a variety of different calls that I'm going to um, translate for you today. The first one I'm going to play is the whale. And this is the sound that you may have heard camping at nighttime. So this is a call that loons make um, as sort of a social interaction. Uh, they do it at nighttime, nighttime to locate their family members. So probably a lot of you have heard this call before. The second um, call that I'm going to play is called the tremolo, and this is a, an alarm call. This is a loon that's maybe a little bit perturbed. It's maybe advertising its territory and saying, um, this is my space, you need to back off. Um, this one's also one that's heard at night. So it's a little bit more um, aggressive of a call. This next call is, uh, is the yodel, and this one's interesting because only male loons give this call. This is the only way that you as observers, and me too, unless I have a, a, I'm catching loons and weighing them, can tell males and females apart. So this is a call that males make. It's a very aggressive territorial call. And scientists have actually figured out that all male loons have, an in, have a unique yodel, and so they can uh, identify individuals by their yodel. The balloon in this picture uh, is, is doing a yodel. That's what it looks like when it's doing that call. This next call is my favorite. It's the hoot, and this is one that not many people hear. This is the loon family call. So when they're in close quarters, they hoot to each other to check on the chick's well-being, to check on each other and see if everyone's doing okay. And then this one is a, a loon chick call. And this is a distress call. Um, this next one I'm going to play is a distress call that we use, uh, biologists use to catch loons. And I'll explain that procedure in a, in a little bit. So by fall, um, after the chicks have uh, grown a lot and molted several times into their winter plumage, they actually end up looking a lot like the adult loons do uh, in their winter plumage. So loons have breeding plumage, and then this, the loon in the front and up uh, at the door are in breeding plumage. And then they molt into a very basic gray um, winter plumage, which looks very similar to um, the juveniles. Um, so the, the Young loons will migrate to the ocean, and they'll actually stay there for up to seven years before they return to the lakes. Um, that's the time when they're uh, becoming um, sexually mature, and so it takes up to seven years for that to happen, before those loon chicks will even try to get back to a lake to breed. So the next section of my talk is uh, about threats to loon populations and sort of um, how we've started studying loons. Um, basically, in the 70s, um, biologists started realizing that the loon population was dropping off drastically. And so we began monitoring loons. The needs of loons are very simple. They need clean, quiet places to have enough food to live. And if any one of those things is missing, then loons are not going to go, they're not going to live on that lake. They're not going to live on that pond. And so biologists began capturing loons. Um, and the process that we use is uh, we can only capture loons that are breeding, and we can only capture them at night currently. So what we do is we take advantage of their um, aggressive nature to protect their young. And we go out in a boat with a big spotlight and a net, and we play chick distress calls. 
and we lure those parent loons in and we scoop them up in a net. And what we do is we put a band on them. We take a blood sample and we take feather samples. So the band that we put on loons is an individual marker. Every loon that's banded has a different band combination. And so biologists can track individual loons through time. By taking blood and feather samples, we can uh, measure the amount of toxins in their bodies, the amount of toxins that they're eating in their food. And then after that, we safely release them. They're okay. It sounds really traumatic, but it, they're all right. And so what we end up doing is sending out biologists like myself uh, to track these loons. So we spend hours in a boat with binoculars trying to get the band combinations. Um, and these are two of the, you know, the best uh, um, positions to get a, a band combination. So this is the foot waggle. Loons stick their feet out sometimes, uh, and it's thought to um, either cool or warm themselves off. Or when they're diving, you can get loon combinations. Another thing that uh, we started doing is collecting uh, dead loons and doing necropsies. Um, the loons that I have on display at this talk are birds that were um, necropsied by um, this gentleman here who works at Tufts University. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how loons are dying. We also collect non-viable eggs and measure toxins in those eggs to see what sorts of um, levels of mercuries and other toxins are in those eggs. I'll talk more about that specifically. So, Basically, what we found in the Northeast, in New York currently, uh, loons are a species of special concern. Um, the, the asterisk next to these numbers indicates that these are numbers that were obtained through um, volunteer loon census. So this is not a comprehensive um, look at the New York's loon population. These are volunteers that went out on one day a year and counted loons on their lakes. So this is not comprehensive, but it gives a good snapshot of um, rises and falls in loon population. So these, these numbers are located um, in the Adirondacks, which is where most of the loons breed in, in New York. So about 500 adults, not quite 100 chicks. In Massachusetts, there are only 32 breeding pairs of loons. They're almost all on the Quabbin Reservoir. There's just not much habitat. There's so much uh, lakeshore development in Massachusetts, they don't have anywhere to go. In Vermont, loons are listed as rare. There's about 200 adults. Only 69% of those adults are nesting, and that's um, kind of an issue. Um, but of those that are nesting, the chick survival rate's pretty high, 84%. In New Hampshire, loons are threatened. We have very comprehensive data about loons in New Hampshire because um, the organization that I worked for at the Loon Preservation Committee counts every single loon on every single lake in New Hampshire every year. And so they have a really good grasp of loons in New Hampshire. Um, about 624 adults, but only a little more than half of those are nesting. Um, pretty high survival rate, though, for chicks. In Maine, loons are not listed. Again, um, because loon, uh, Maine has such a rural um, landscape where people don't necessarily live on the lakes, um, we can't uh, monitor all the lakes in Maine. So again, the, the, these numbers are from volunteer monitoring. And so the people that are counting loons live on lakes like Sebago or Little Sebago. And they live mostly in southern Maine. That's where the loons that we're counting are. No one lives up in, you know, northern Maine. And so we don't know how many loons are up there. This is, again, not a comprehensive view. <laughs> this is not a comprehensive view of the loons in Maine. <laughs> Um, so, so the estimate um, that, that, well, these are the numbers that were counted last year, about 3,200 adult loons. I don't know how many chicks. Um, it's estimated that, this, that the um, chicks that are hatched per territorial pair is about 0.46. So each territorial pair of loons produces half a chick, which doesn't really make any sense. But, um, but if you compare that to New Hampshire, New Hampshire's got one, over, a little over one chick per territorial pair. So, I don't know, that's a little, um, that's a little low. So, the, some of the things that we identify as being major threats to loons, one of them is shoreline development. So, if we, we are living on the shoreline with, uh, you know, houses and lawns butting up to the shoreline, that means that loons aren't going to nest there necessarily. There are some brave loons that will try to nest, uh, but if we develop the shoreline, no nesting for loons, they're going to they're gonna be out of there. Drastic water fluctuations. Um, affect loons. So this is sort of a, a, an annual thing. If we get a lot of rainfall, 
the water level rises a lot, and that can actually um, uh, drown out nests. If an, if an egg is exposed to water, it's going to become non-viable because it'll cool off too much. And if we have too low uh, a water level, then the loons get stranded. They can't hop back up on their nests. So water level fluctuation is something um, that's largely determined by the amount of rain that we get, but it, is an, it has an impact nonetheless. Recreational use is a big one. These people are too close to this loon. Okay? Um, when a loon gets threatened um, by a person that's too close, it does this uh, peering over its nest. This looks really bizarre, but this loon's like, if you get any closer, I'm out of here. It's going to slip right off the nest in the water because at some point that loon has to look out for itself instead of its eggs. And so this loon's getting ready to abandon. What happens when the loon is, uh, is off the nest is eggs get predated, eggs get overheated. Okay, so uh, general word uh, to the public, don't just keep your distance from loons. Another um, point that I like to make is that um, if we're close to loons that have chicks, those loons are always looking over their back because they they're not like friends with us. They think that we're predators. Um, and so I always like to make the comparison, you know, those of you who have children, think if you were out in public and there was someone following you around the whole time and you thought that they were going to steal your kids, that would be very stressful for you. Um, you would spend less time taking care of yourself. You would spend less time taking care of your kids because you're always looking over your back. And that's how I compare um, sort of following around loons with chicks. Those loons are very uncomfortable and it's, it's a stressor for them. Um, once chicks uh, are hatched, they're not sort of out of danger. Um, loon chicks are very vulnerable to um, boat collisions. It's actually the number one cause of death of loon chicks in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, are, are boat collisions because they're tiny. They're these little fuzzy things. They blend in with the color of the water, and if there's a wake, you're not going to see it. Um, another recreational hazard is monofilament. So sometimes loons uh, get tangled up in fishing line. I've seen this happen a number of times, or they get uh, lures hooked into their um, bodies, and those loons get tangled up, and they can't untangle themselves, and they eventually starve to death. Another big um, recreational hazard for loons are lead sinkers. So loons, uh, because they don't have teeth, they swallow rocks to grind up their food. And so it just happens that lead sinkers are about the same size uh, as the rocks that they swallow. So they swallow these lead sinkers. It's abraded against other rocks and broken up by digestive juices, and these loons get lead poisoning. This is a, a, from a necropsy of a loon uh, that swallowed a lead sinker. Um, this is a loon that has passed away from um, lead poisoning. Once a loon exhibits lead poisoning symptoms, it's too late to save them. Uh, they have to be euthanized. So there's actually a lot of legislation um, outlawing certain sizes of lead sinkers, which is great. Um, Non-point source pollution is sort of, you know, my, the, my baby. Um, Non-point source pollution is pollution that we don't really know where it comes from. We can't locate a single source. Um, loons live in places that are um, impacted by non-point source pollution, specifically mercury. Um, this is a map of uh, mercury deposition in the United States. And what you can see is uh, orange and red are the highest colors. Um, and we have really high mercury deposition in the Northeast. What happens is um, we dig up uh, coal out of the ground and we burn it for electricity and that releases mercury into the environment. And that mercury travels on weather patterns. So guess what? All the um, coal fire power plants are downwind for, or upwind from us. So it blows over, and it call, falls down in the rain and the snow, and it lands in our lakes. And that's why we're finding really high levels of mercury in, in these, these remote lakes in Maine, is because it's coming over um, from these coal fire power plants. And in fact, uh, loons in New England have the highest mercury levels of any loons in the United States. So we've got Alaska, Northwest US, the Great Lakes, and New England. Um, so that's uh, almost two parts per million. And I'll, I'll give you a reference point for that in a second. Um, this is a, a figure that's showing um, mercury levels in, in breeding adult loons. Uh, and this is uh, organized from west to east. And so Maine is the, is the last state there. What you can see is that um, we have really high levels compared to these other states. You see the red line that, that's right at the three part per million um, part of the graph. That's the level at which scientists have found that loon productivity is affected by mercury. And so what that means is, um, 
at that level, we start seeing loons that are sort of foggy-headed. They don't make good decisions because they're being affected by mercury as a neurotoxin. And so, as a result, they have low productivity. Maybe they don't watch their chicks as much. Maybe um, some predator comes along and eats their, their chick because they've got their back turned for too long. Maybe they're off the nest for too long and those eggs are exposed to the heat and they become non-viable. It's these sort of poor decisions um, that we're finding mercury um, contributes to in loons. And that level that we found it starting at is three parts per million. Um, there was a very comprehensive study done in Maine and New Hampshire um, that found uh, levels ranging from 1.3 all the way up to 10.8 parts per million uh, of mercury in our loons. Um, and so, it, as I said, it's, it's those small, poor decisions that um, have effects on the productivity of these loons. Um, this is a figure that's showing, um, this is from necropsy data from loons in New Hampshire. The leading uh, causes of loon mort mortality that we know of in New Hampshire, 50% um, of loons in New Hampshire um, that were collected died from lead poisoning, which is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Um, other things, other major um, factors are monofilament, um, boat collisions, unknown trauma. Sometimes loon gets in, loons get in fight with each other, they get in territorial battles and they kill each other. I mean, it happens. Um, and then we've got some unknown sources, but um, lead fishing tackle is a big one. So what are scientists doing? Um, we are uh, putting up signs at boat launches uh, where education is a big key. Um, having lead, lead tackle exchange programs. So, you know, telling fishermen, you know, this is, this is the effect that, you're, that the lead tackle has on these birds. Here's some nickel tackle. Try that out. Um, and, and also providing this scientific data to educate um, lawmakers so that they can make decisions on our behalf about um, the environment and about loons. Another thing that we do, this is, I have such a love-hate relationship with loon rafts. Um, I, I hate them, but they work. <laughs> um, loon rafts are, are um, biologists attempt to reintroduce loons to lakes where there's no natural nesting habitat. And so like Lake Winnipesaukee is a good example of a place that has loon rafts because there's so many houses on that lake, there's nowhere for them to nest. So what happens though is if we overuse these nests, these loons are going to be like, oh, sweet, a nest, and they're not going to nest in their natural habitat. What I want to see happen is us preserve their natural habitat and not have to give them a Band-Aid, a nest, so that they'll uh, use it in nests. So when people ask me, how do you make a, a loon raft, I say, you don't make a loon raft. <laughs> um, are these procedures working? Yes, they are. This is um, from the Loon Preservation Committee. These are loons in New Hampshire, and, but these are the techniques that they've used in, in New Hampshire to recover their loon population. What you'll see is starting in the 70s all the way up to 2010, there's been a, a big increase in loon numbers. So that's good. This stuff works. Um, what you can do as maybe loon advocates if you are, Watch loons from a distance, uh, you know, respect their, their boundaries. Um, support water quality and shoreline protection measures. So things that um, laws, uh, legislation, lawmakers that are uh, in support of protecting the shoreline and water quality. If you see monofilament, this is a great thing to do with kids. I, I, I always tell kids when I go out in the field with them, pick up that monofilament. If a loon doesn't get tangled in it, something else will. Um, support alternative energy sources, coal-fired power plants, bad news. Um, pass on this information to others, educate others. You can participate in the Audubon annual loon census if you live on a lake. Even if you don't, you can get uh, involved. And so what Audubon does is they send out volunteers one day a year and we get a snapshot of loons in Maine. And then there are, um, the Biodiversity Research Institute has an adopt a loon program where you can um, basically donate um, funds to their loon research and you'll get like the band combination of a specific loon you can they'll send you like updates about how many chicks it had each year which is kind of a cool program um, I need to thank these people and these organizations for contributing content and pictures to this presentation the loon preservation committee the biodiversity research institute um, and then the last three are um, people and organizations whose figures that I used for this presentation and so uh, now I'd like to open up for questions, if anyone has any. Can you hear me? Yes. Do loons have any predators other than humans? Uh, they, other loons are predators. 
So intruding loons. Um, loon chicks are vulnerable to actually, we're seeing uh, as a, there's been a recovery in the bald eagle population, they're picking off more and more loon chicks. Um, so that's a predator. Large fish are predators to loon chicks. Um, adult loons don't really have too many natural predators. It's the younger ones that, that are, are kind of in danger from the predators. Snapping turtles would definitely take a loon chick, yep. A loon chick, yeah. I don't, a, an eagle could not fly. I've heard stories. I've heard stories of people seeing eagles flying off of adult loons, but I don't believe them. <laughs> um, they're too, the loons are too heavy for that, but a chick, definitely. Yep. Or to warm up. So it depends on what the air temperature is compared to the water temperature. That's our theory. Uh, I was curious. Um, a number of birds are are monogamous. I was wondering if you know if loons are monogamous. Um, I would love if they were, because that would be a sweet story. Um, but but they're not. They're they're sort of opportunistic maters. So um, if two loons uh, are successful in in breeding, uh, they'll stick it out. They'll stick together. But for example, if there's a female loon in a territory and she's got a mate and this other mate comes in and he's like tougher and stronger, then, then he'll win. He gets kicked out and he'll mate with a female. And so um, sometimes we see fidelity for a long period of time, but that's not a guarantee. So they're not monogamous. Nope. Um, in the, uh, the slide when you were comparing mercury levels across different states, how come in the, the highlighted northeast section, Vermont was like substantially lower than the other ones? You, you're, why, why was why. it? Yeah. Um, it may have to do with a weather patterns. I'm not entirely sure why they're a lot lower. Um, I know that um, Massachusetts has really high levels. Um, New York's aren't as high either. It, I, I'm not entirely sure why. I bet it has to do with um, the, the weather patterns, though. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a guess. <laughs> Do during the day? During the day? Yeah. Well, loons, when they get up early in the morning, they, so if we have a loon that has chicks, they're going to be fishing a lot. And so what happens is usually the mom loon will hang out with the chicks and the dad loon will go fish and then the dad loon will come back and hang out with chicks while the mom goes and fishes. And you know what they sometimes do is, is they'll actually, if the babies are really little, they'll stash them right in the grass. They'll say, you hang out here, we're going to go fishing together. And so they like to hang out and they fish. They're always keeping an eye out for predators. Yep. You're welcome. Oh. <laughs> what's, the, what's the typical life expectancy of uh, an, a loon? Loons can live up to 30 years. They're very long lived. And so that's one of the reasons why we're seeing um, effects of mercury because um, loons can get rid of mercury. Uh, through, through molting, so they can grow it out in their feathers. Female loons actually dump mercury into eggs that they lay, which is good for the female, but not for the, for the chick. Um, and so there's a certain net amount of mercury that they can't get rid of, and it builds up year after year after year. And so long-lived birds like loons that can live up to 30 years, and bald eagles also, are, are experiencing these reductions in productivity. Are the loons picky when it comes to uh, uh, fish species, meaning um, if there are invasive fish or, you know, fish that are stocked that are, don't belong there, uh, do they, are they, are they choosy when it comes to fish species? Um, I know that they, they go for stuff of a certain size, and I don't know whether or not they prefer fish of a certain species. I know that they like perch. Um, I don't know above and beyond that whether they're too picky or if they're just they're just after a certain size fish. So I don't I don't actually know if there's any preference in, for fish species and loons. We talked about the junior loons. I call them junior loons. Leave in the fall, and they go away for seven years. So they return to the same lakes. Is there? They studies? might. Um, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. They're going to go. Um, any place that's uh, easy to get to that has good food sources. Typically loons that um, 
come back that first year don't breed because they're like the newbies. Um, but but sometimes they might. Um, oftentimes they don't. So it's it's there's not a it's not a yes or no answer. It's sometimes. Mel, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. I'm glad I don't have to present after you because it's a very you did a very nice job. Um, one question I had was, um, what's the deal with the red eyes? And, and are they do they do they always have red eyes? Do the red eyes change? Why do they have red eyes? So the red eye actually um, is it, part of their breeding. It's not plumage, but it's part of their breeding garb. Um, the red eye actually um, it doesn't go away completely, but it greatly diminishes in that red color during uh, the winter, and so. You know, the theory is that the red eye somehow helps them hunt uh, for fish underwater. It may also be a um, attraction thing, you know, because it's around during the breeding season, and so maybe it's part of their pretty plumage where it helps them choose a mate. Um, so those are two theories about the red eye. Um, I saw a headline only, and I didn't read the article, um, just a couple days ago about loons being susceptible to the same disease that is killing bats. Do you know? I have not heard that. Whatever. The, the this, fungus, the fungal disease. Yeah. Killing that bats. Was, no, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Sister? Yeah. You talked about loons being territorial. Is there a like optimum number of loons that like to live together? Yes. Um, can there be too many loons in a population? Yes. Um, depending on the size of the lake and and um, how much nesting habitat there is, there there's definitely a carrying capacity for lakes. Um, for example, Sebago Lake has very few loons for the amount of loons that we would think would be on Sebago Lake. So this is a lake that I want to get my hands on and study. Um, there's this big lake, a huge lake, but there's only uh, an estimate, estimated number of like 20 loons on the lake. And we would expect there to be a lot more than that um, based on the size. Um, and so if, a, if there are too many loons on a lake, what happens is, you know, there's territorial fights. Those loons get kicked out. Um, they, the, the weaker loons have to go somewhere else. And so there's definitely a, a point where um, there's a lot of tension if there's too many loons on the lake because they'll definitely defend their territories. So there's, I, you know, I, I have a number of personal theories about why there's um, not many loons on the lake. That it may be due to food sources. Uh, it may be due to um, the amount of recreational use that's on the lake. Also, um, the amount of development that, that the shoreline has on Sebago Lake, um, and even the even the the shoreline that's not developed isn't prime loon nesting habitat. They like. Um, areas that are sort of grassy, they can't nest on rocky shorelines like the stuff that you see down at our beach that's not good moon nesting habitat. And so um, those are a few, a few things that um, might be contributing to the low loon count here. Um, totally yeah. What explains your passion for this type of focus? How long have you been involved in it, and can you, what's your? What's I have always loved the outdoors since I was a kid. I was always outside as a child, and so that's kind of where it started. Um, and so I went to school and, and majored in sciences, and I didn't actually start working with birds until I'd graduated from my undergraduate degree and, and became a loon biologist on Lake Umbagog, which is on the Maine New Hampshire border. And I, I fell in love with, um, with birds, and I'm just I'm just enthralled by them because they're so different from every other animal species, and I I'm very um, personally I just really like solving problems. I like figuring stuff out, and so using animals to sort of figure out um, uh, what's going on in the environment really intrigues me. Um, and so it's sort of like solving a mystery. It's like it's like 
um, almost like a crime scene to me. It's not that's a bad comparison, but I'm intrigued by those connections, and so that's how I that's how I sort of got involved with um, with birds. I, I guess I'm curious about the lack of, how can I say it? You said there wasn't much going on in the Northern Lakes for studies, research, et cetera, knowledge about loon populations. Why is that? And is it just that your group is not working on that or? The reason that there's not um, many loon studies in Maine uh, is because of money uh, and resources. Um, Unfortunately, in the sciences, and those of you in the sciences know this, um, it's hard to get funding for something unless it directly benefits humans, unfortunately. And so loons, they're not threatened. Um, you know, they're doing okay. They're, they're not having an effect on humans, so why spend money on them? And it's sort of like, we're not going to spend money on it until they're, like, already threatened or they're, you know, going endangered. Um, and, and the other problem with Maine, it's not a problem, I actually like it a lot, but the other issue about Maine is that um, because not many people live in northern Maine, um, there's not many people that are sort of monitoring loons up there. For the state to pay someone to go monitor loons in northern Maine would be a lot of money. And so um, because they're not listed, it's just not a priority, unfortunately. In other states like New Hampshire and Vermont, because their their numbers are so low, they have money to study those. Also, the states are a lot smaller; it's easier to get around. All right. Well, we thank you very much.